Good morning. Good morning. So, great to be with you. My name is Tom. I'm not normally here, but I'm happy to be here this morning. I uh, found out yesterday I was coming, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, you know Calvary Bible Church is a church that began in Boulder, and we have three campuses, Boulder and Erie and Thornton. And um, we, we delight that we're one church that meets together to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in the world. And uh, we, we get to do it in three different places. And we all meet together and we preach the same things. And we're moving along as a church in three different cities. In the city of Boulder yesterday, the wind blew hard enough for Excel Energy to declare that they have to turn the power off. So we learned yesterday that we would not have any power on the Boulder campus Sunday morning, and uh, we could meet. Uh, I was with somebody last night who said, what, you canceled church just because you don't have power? Uh, can't you use candles? And we could, but in a day's notice, we decided we weren't going to do that. And uh, something else happened on this campus yesterday. You all know what happened yesterday? Oh, a little Everett Thompson was born yesterday. <clears throat> and Zach was planning to this for his last Sunday that he would preach here before uh, Emily gave birth to their little son. And that happened yesterday, a little bit ahead of schedule. So Zach was not going to be here today. So without being in Boulder and Zach not being here, it worked out in the providence of God that I can be here. So I'm glad to be here with you this morning. We're going to start a new series, as you saw, in the book of Nehemiah. Somebody said before the service, I never really thought about studying the book of Nehemiah. Why would we study the book of Nehemiah? And I'm going to tell you why. Do you love a good story? Yes. Don't you love a good story? I read a story on vacation a while back, and it was a story about an octopus and an older woman and her grandson. And it's a really complex but beautifully written book about... Uh, I was on vacation, so I wasn't thinking about anything related to church, and this was nothing related to church. But it was a great story that unfolded and a look back at the past... And when you really look at what the past is like, it helps you understand the beautiful future that could be, but seemed impossible. The Bible is a story. It really is a story from Genesis to the book of Revelation, and we believe the Bible is the Word of God, and we like to open it up and say, this is what God says to us. But the further back you get from the book of the Bible, the more you can see the thread of God working in it all the way through in a story that begins in a garden and ends in a refinished garden. And all along the way, there are these episodes that happen to people who are following God in which they go through great travail, many of which they create themselves, and God carries them to a place, and then He rescues them and brings them back. And Nehemiah is one of the stories in the Bible that we're going to look back at and see how dark it was and yet how God delivered his people into a new place. But it doesn't end. The book of Nehemiah is one of the last events that happen in the history of the Old Testament. Now it's not at the end of your Old Testament in the list of books because the books that are after it in your table of contents have to be put back into time of the history of Israel. So we're going to do a history lesson. How many of you like history? Yeah, I saw those heads shake. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but stay with me because it's important to find where it is in the story. You know, sometimes you read a book and say, what is going on? And it doesn't come into focus till you get to the end and say, oh, I get it. That's the beauty of literature. Well, the Bible's literature, and we're going to look at this episode in the book of Nehemiah. And I hope over the next nine or ten weeks, what we'll do is we'll see how God was working in his people because the book of Nehemiah is a pointer to the way God works with his people. It is a pointer to a really big theme of deliverance, which doesn't fully become accomplished until we get to the New Testament and Jesus Christ comes into the world and he delivers us from our sins. And you might just have in your mind this morning that where we're going to end our service is at communion. So maybe during the service, you would just be preparing your heart. Am I ready to take communion this morning? Communion is our opportunity to eat the bread 
and drink the cup and remember our ultimate deliverance from Jesus Christ, that he's our savior, that he forgives us, that he makes us his own children. We are the sons and daughters of God because he loves us. So that's where we're going. But let me give you a little history, can I? So think back in the Old Testament, and when you get to the Old Testament, you'll know that God did many things. I'm going to jump into the middle of the history of Israel, where Israel said to God, we want a king like all the other nations. We want to be like the king, uh, the other nations, and have kings who rule over us. So here's a little slide that shows you the three kings of Israel prior to something happening in the kingdom. There were three of them, Saul and David, and Solomon. And the years that that happened, we know in history, is approximately 1043 B.C. till about 931 B.C. And those three kings were, Solomon had no heart for God, David had a whole heart for God. I'm sorry, let me say that again. Saul had no heart for God, David had a whole heart for God, and Solomon had maybe half a heart for God. He, he fell off at the end. And when he for, fell off at the end, what happened to the, to the whole nation Israel, it divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And that happened in 931 under the leadership of Solomon where there had just been three kings that had led a united nation of Israel back in the land. And then under Solomon, the kingdom split. And it's called in the northern kingdom, referred to as Israel. And it's composed of ten tribes of Israel. And uh, they existed from 931 until 722. And in 722, because of their idolatry and disobedience, they were taken into captivity by Assyria. There were 19 kings in that period of time, from 931 until 722. 19 kings in the northern kingdom of Israel. How many of them were good kings? Who? Zero. Zero kings in the northern kingdom. So they lasted the shortest amount of time. And they were taken into captivity into, uh, by Assyria. The southern kingdom is referred to as Judah. It's composed of the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. Are you still with me? Okay, some of you say, oh, this is really riveting. And others of you say, okay, when, when are we getting to the good stuff? This is the good stuff, okay? You got to have this. Um, and uh, this, this kingdom fared better because they had 20 kings and eight of them were good. They, they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But frequently... We hear of the kings of the southern kingdom. What we heard of the kings in the northern kingdom, they did what was evil in the sight of God. And so finally, um, <clears throat> they were taken into captivity as well. First in 605, and then 597, and in 586 in the Babylonian captivity. Babylon was the kingdom that came and took the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah, into captivity. Why did they do that? Why did that happen? We're going to look at that in a moment. But they were taken into captivity because of their idolatry and because they were disobedient to the Lord. And he said, come on, return to me, return to me. And if you return to me, I will heal your land. I will preserve you. But they did not. Now, where do we see that? Well, we had prophets who were prophesying during the times of the kings. You know them, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And the prophets were telling Israel, repent or else, repent or else. Do you think they had enough warning? They had plenty of warning, but their hearts were hardened and they did not listen to the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 25, one of the prophets of God actually spoke against Judah. And when Jeremiah spoke against Judah, Judah, there are about five distinct statements. I'm going to read to you. You can turn there if you like, Jeremiah chapter 25. But it's the word to Judah while they are just on the precipice of going off into captivity. Jeremiah chapter 25, here, watch for these statements. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Some of this is making a connection for you now, right? So you have Judah, Jehoiakim, you have Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for 23 years. 
From the thirteenth year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear. Though the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants and the prophets, saying, Turn now, every one of you, from your evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given you and your fathers from old and forever. Don't go after other gods to serve them or worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands, and then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands and to your own harm. And I've just captured the st statements that I think are relevant that Jeremiah is saying, you're not listening, you're not listening. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, we really can. We can imagine that we could live a lot of the days of our life without listening to what the Lord says. So why are these things written for us? They're written for us to get a glimpse of a people in the story of God who listened to his voice. He had many prophets that came and spoke and refused to listen to them. And so what's going to happen? Well, it's over. It's done. Judah, you're done. You're going to Babylon. And you're going to head off into captivity. Now, who did they take when they took people off into captivity? They took the leaders they took the most educated, they took artisans, they took nobility and priests, and not all the people of Judah left into captivity, but some of the most distinguished people. Can you name any of them? Daniel. Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it suddenly takes us back. Oh yeah, we're going to look at those in just a minute. So you might think all of a sudden that Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, is over. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 8, 9, and 11, it says, Therefore the Lord of hosts says, Because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring him against the land of Judah and its inhabitants, against all these surrounding nations, and the whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for everybody. 70 years. So they're going to go into captivity for 70 years. The next verse in Jeremiah 25 says, Then after 70 years are completed, I'll punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. And I'll bring upon the land all the words that I've uttered against it, everything that's written in the book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. So here's the history. Israel in the land... Three kings, Saul, David, Solomon, kingdom splits, two nations, lots of bad kings in the north, they go to Assyria, mostly bad kings in the south, they get taken into captivity in Babylon, and God is working in the scenes that's saying, I'm going to raise up Nebuchadnezzar and bring him in, and I'm going to accomplish this. So God is telling his people, you're going to go to Babylon. Now, one of the last things God says through the prophet Jeremiah to the southern kingdom that's going to be taken captivity into Babylon is Jeremiah 29, 7. Can we read it out loud together? But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. Okay, now that is how God's saying to his people, I'm going to send you to Babylon. But while you're in Babylon, because you're my people, I want you to seek the welfare of Babylon. Because you're my people. Pray for the city of Babylon. Because if the Babylon prospers, you will prosper. I just want you to see the flow of the story that God has a people. He never is finished with them. He may chasten them and send them <laughs> after many, 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 many warnings into a place of captivity. But this is what he wants them to do. I want you to be my people, my distinct people. While you're living in a place like Babylon, you be my people. Pray for Babylon. Seek its welfare. Are there any transferable concepts for us today? Hey, we are exiles. We're on, this is not our home. So... What do you think God would want 
we who live in Thornton to do for the city of Thornton. That's what Micah 6 eight's about. That's what we heard about this morning. This project that's coming up for all of our campuses, we're all going to seek the welfare of our community and pray for, to the Lord for its behalf and try to be exemplary exiles in the land we are until we get to our promised land. We're not home yet, everybody. We don't want to be too comfortable here. We, we're living as exiles seeking the welfare of the city. So that's the whole scene that we are. And so 70 years... Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, is going into captivity. During that time, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel all speak to the captives and some of the remnant who remain back in the Jerusalem area. So Daniel is one of those. I want you to think back to Daniel. Those of you who know your Bible, Daniel has a couple of episodes in there, and um, Nebuchadnezzar is now the king of Babylon, so he's got his captives. You look at the opening chapters of Daniel, and you can read the great stories of Daniel in the lion's den, and Daniel interpreting visions. And suddenly you come to Daniel chapter 5, and something important happens in Daniel's lifetime. He's a contemporary living all of those 70 years in Babylon, and something happens in Daniel chapter 5. And some of you will remember that there is this handwriting on the wall. And it has some funny words on it. And the words on the wall are, many, many, tekel, parson. Who knows what that means? No one knew what it meant. And they had to call somebody to interpret it, and they called Daniel. In Daniel chapter 5. And Daniel comes in, and this is what essentially it means. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now Daniel says that to Belshazzar, who is a successor to Nebuchadnezzar. All right, raise your hand if you're still with me. Right, so it's a lot of stuff, right? But I just want you to see that God is, is working in this moment. Nebuchadnezzar's off the scene. The last king in Babylon is Belshazzar. And the handwriting of the wall says this. You're done. It's over. You've been found wanting. And the days of your kingdom are done. That's Daniel. Babylon comes to an end this night. Daniel chapter 5, verse 30 and 31 says, That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years of age. Now, I think Darius was probably a governor in Jerusalem for the Persian Empire. Okay, and actually Persia overthrows Babylon that night. Handwriting on the wall, it's over. Babylon's done, and now a, God raises up a new kingdom, the kingdom of Persia, and Persia begins to rule and has new rulers. Now, if you go back to what we read, remember when God said, I'm going to send you, and then at the end of that time, I'm going to raise somebody up, and I'm going to punish Nebuchadnezzar in his line? That's this. That's what's happening. So God is setting up kings. We should all remember, right? God sets up kings. God is sovereign. An election's coming. Everybody say it with me. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Do you believe it? Yes. Okay, you should enter into September, October, November saying to yourself, God is sovereign. He put down Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar and raised up Darius, and we're going to see Cyrus, and that's what God does. He, he's in charge. We're not. Praise God. Okay, this is a picture for us. This is part of the unfolding story. So, Babylon's gone. Who's next? Well, who's next is the empire of Persia. And Cyrus is the first Persian ruler. And when he comes into power, we're almost done with this. When he comes into power, he has a whole new uh, strategy for how he's going to treat the exiles from Judah. And he's going to sponsor a return for them to go back to Judah. And the only thing you should note here is that there are three returns of the exiles who'd been in Babylon and now Persia has taken over. So those re exiles are going to return in three movements. In 538 under Zerubbabel, 
Say that name. Zerubbabel. It's just a fun name to say. Zerubbabel. I wonder why Zach didn't name his son Zerubbabel. <laughs> Zerubbabel goes back to Jerusalem, sponsored by Cyrus in uh, 538. It's recorded for us in Ezra chapters 1 through 6. That's the first return of the exiles. And what he's going to do is rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And then Cyrus sponsors a second return, and this is under Ezra in five, uh, 458, and it's recorded for us in Ezra chapter 6, uh, 7 through 10. And what Ezra's going to do is he's going to restore worship and the community of the people and the teaching of the Torah, the, the law. That's what Ezra is going to do. And the last return is in Nehemiah, all the chapters of Nehemiah where Cyrus sponsors and pays for a return of the exiles to rebuild the walls around the city. There's your story. And everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> Except they didn't. And Nehemiah is the whole journey of God's people coming back. Uh, we're going to look at the, the journey to come back and rebuild the wall. But it's God working in his people, through his people, to do a project together. And he is fulfilling his promise. What I would want to say to you is God is faithful. And he always keeps his word. And once you see the chronology of it all, you'll see that God said, I'm going to do this if you don't. I'm going to do this if you don't. You didn't. So I'm going to do this. Send it to Babylon. Okay, you stay there. You seek the welfare of Babylon. And I'll bring you back to the land. And Nebuchadnezzar, who is so awful to you, I'm going to punish him. I'm going to raise somebody else up. And I'm going to deliver you back. And then God does deliver him back. And they this is their return. So you could read Ezra and Nehemiah. They actually go together and were once thought to be one book together, or Nehemiah was second Ezra. But we've divided them now. So you have Ezra, because that's a return out of captivity to build the temple, restore the law. Nehemiah is a return out of captivity to rebuild the walls around the city. That's the story. We're going to look at Nehemiah because in the return to rebuild the walls, there are all kinds of lessons about leadership, about being submitted to the Lord, about praying, about adversity. And we're going to learn how God used his people, particularly under one man who had a vision that things were not as they ought to be. And God created a new future where it seemed to be impossible. Now, the punchline is at the end of Nehemiah, it really doesn't end as well as we hoped it would. Why? Well, it's back to that, that deal. Is that the Old Testament is a story being unfolded for us. And God is working in His people. But at the end of Nehemiah, there are actually 400 years or so from the end of Nehemiah until you get to Matthew. 400 silent years of God not speaking through a prophet. And then the real answer comes in Christ. And did I tell you that that's what we celebrate most and why we're going to have communion together? Let me close with two verses that will help us. That one I'd love for you to memorize as we go through the book of Nehemiah. It's Nehemiah 9.17. But you are a God ready to, everybody, forgive. So all the disaster that they went through, but Nehemiah is saying, God, you are a God who is ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. Listen, this is the heart of Nehemiah, what he wants for his people that are going to work with him. He wants them to know the God we serve is a God who's ready to forgive. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's patient with us. And... He, he's just not going to forsake you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Aren't you glad that that's the way God treats us? Because have you ever wandered off and felt like you got captive in a sin or a habit or a dark place? And isn't it great to know that's the way God was in his day? That's the way he is in our day. And if you, uh, if you came to church today and you're in a dark place or you're stuck I want you to be thinking, this is the kind of God we serve. And the most magnanimous way that he demonstrated this kind of mercy and grace is in Christ, 
which we don't get to to the New Testament, Nehemiah is a pointer to that. Now, the last verse I would say is that all this stuff, you say, well, why would we study the Old Testament? Here's why. In Romans chapter 15, this is what the Apostle Paul said. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Why? That through the endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, you might have everybody. We should be the most hopeful people in the world. Oh, the world's falling apart. I know. There's going to be an eclipse tomorrow and the world's going to end. I know. No, I don't know that. We don't know what's going to happen. The, the election, you say, it's terrible. Oh, it's all terrible. And it was terrible then. And what do we know? We have a God who is loving, kind, patient. He's never going to forsake us. And all these things that were written in the Old Testament are for our hope. So here's your assignment. Why don't you go home and read chapter 1? Maybe read the whole book through, but we're going to be in chapter 1 next week. And I pray that what it will do for all of us, it will help us love God, love His patience, know that we are, hey, we are in our day. Nehemiah is writing to, to his day. He's, he's giving his memoir of his day. And someday there'll be a story told of what did we do in Thornton in our day as the exiles waiting to go to heaven. What will we do with the time God gives to us? It may look impossible, but just by looking back into Nehemiah, I, I think we're going to get a vision of the hopeful work of God in every day. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that you said, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. That's what you said to your people when they faced dark times. And you've continued to do that. And the greatest way that you demonstrated your love and your care and your forgiveness and your provision was through your son Jesus. And all of these things that we think about in the Old Testament were waiting for the final work of God to bring us to you, to make us your own children. I thank you that we get to reflect on the past and think about the perfect work of Jesus for us today. And so I pray, God, that even as we get ready to take communion this morning, to remember your death for us, your final work of grace, to save us and bring us to glory, that you'll just prepare our hearts. May there be um, something just ringing in our hearts that we would not be like those who refuse to listen to you, but we'd be those who, who want to listen, who, who turn away from evil, repent of our sins, and find forgiveness in Jesus. So may there just be a sense of cleansing as we come to the communion table this morning and um, an appreciation in our hearts for all that you have done for us. We love you, God. We love you, Christ Jesus, our Savior. And Spirit of God, we pray that you'll work in our hearts to give us your hope and security in Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Now the servers will come to the station. There's a station here on the right and left and another station in the back. And uh, when you're ready, as you pray silently, you can just come up and they will serve you while you're here. And we'll just take communion together as you come.